But I, I do, I cannot um, thank you enough, John, and I want to get the floor turned over to you so that we have as much time as possible for your presentation and discussion. Everybody, welcome to John. So, thank you very much, M Michael. It's my pleasure to be here with you once more. So the first issue I, I want to stress is that Marx, uh, Marx's theory of value is different from the Ricardian approach to value. Uh, that is, my, Karl Marx is not a sophisticated David Ricardo. In other words, he is not a proponent of the ca classical notion of value as labor expended. Marx developed in oh, capital oh. and in his other mature economic writings a monetary theory of value. And my first slide is going to be a citation, or rather two citations by Karl Marx. The social character of labor appears as the money existence of the commodity. This thing, the, commo the money existence of the commodity, money, uh, represents or, or appears to be something that expresses the social relationship, the social character of labor in capitalism. And social labor time exists in these commodities in a later state, so as to speak, to speak, and becomes evident only in the course of their exchange. Um, this means that the problem of commensurability and consequently exchangeability of qualitatively different use values cannot be solved on the basis of the Ricardian or classical assertion that all commodities are values because they are products of labor. And this is because different forms of labor are not commensurable with one another. Marx writes in uh, um, the uh, or text, uh, no, no, in the um, in, uh, uh, critique of political economy, which has been translated um, a little bit different, critique the uh, political and economy. Let us suppose that one arms of gold, one ton of iron, one quarter of wheat, and 20 yards of silk are exchange values of equal magnitude. But digging gold, mining iron, cultivating wheat, and weaving silk are qualitatively different kinds of labor. In fact, what appears objectively as diversity of the use values appears when looked at dynamically as diversity of the activities which produce those use values. So I think this is a very important point. And Marx, um, uh, we have to bear in mind that Marx analyzed value as an expression of relations exclusively characteristic of the capitalist mode of production. That is, value is a relationship uh, of um, exchange between each commodity and all other commodities and expresses the effect of the specifically capitalist homogenization of the labor process in capitalism. In other words, a labor process which is production for exchange and for profit, not production in, in general, but production for exchange and profit. Uh, and we have Mark saying that um, the concept of value is entirely peculiar to the most modern economy since it is the most uh, abstract expression of capital itself and of the production resting on it. In the concept of value, its secret is betrayed. Uh, we can find in Marx's mature works many expressions like that. For example, he writes somewhere that in the um, um, uh, Indian community we have um, labor which is um, 
uh, of different kinds, but we don't have exchange. Um, we um, cannot imagine uh, the, the concept of value outside of capitalism. And something that I have already said, that uh, commodities do not assume the form of direct mutual exchangeability, that is barter. Their socially validated form is a mediated one. Uh, that is uh, mediated through money. Money is a, a, a necessary um, aspect of the exchange process. So, um, Marx, of course, uh, writes that uh, value is determined by abstract labor, as it, uh, he calls it. However, abstract labor is not an empirical magnitude that could be measured using a stopwatch so that we could have two measures, one of labor time measured by the stopwatch and the other by money. Uh, abstract labor is an abstraction constituted in acquiring a tangible existence in the process, in the process of exchange. And let me show the next um, uh, <clears throat> no no let, let's keep it here. So Marx argues that um, uh, in in this previous in the previous uh, citation. Uh, social labor times exists in these commodities in a latent state, and so to speak, and becomes evident only in the course of their exchange, not beforehand. We don't know how much value is in a commodity before the exchange process. So money and the exchange process play a very crucial role. And uh, now we come to money itself, and um, uh, we see that... Uh, Money is not um, just a measure or a means, but also tends to acquire a function of an end in itself, as Marx writes. The circulation of money leads to capital in Grundrisse. Value, therefore, now becomes value in process, money in process, and as such, capital. The circulation of money is, uh, as capital is an end in itself for the expansion of value takes place only within this constantly renewed movement. So the circulation of money leads to capital and capital is an end in itself. This is the first uh, still immature, let's say provisional, but uh, valid um, definition of capital money functioning as an end in itself. <clears throat> However, the question now comes, when does money function as an end in itself? And Marx says that money function uh, 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 like that as an end in itself when it um, uh, succeeds in incorporating the uh, production process into the circulation process. So we have the circuit of capital, which is, uh, can be, be described as money, uh, commodity money, but in the uh, expanded form is like this that we see here, money which buys commodities, but certain special commodities that is means of production and labor power, the money owner uh, combines these commodities in, in, in the production uh, process, which he rules, he dominates over it, in order to create an output, C accent, which is expected to uh, have a higher value, that is to uh, acquire more money, money plus delta M, M plus delta M, when it is sold in the 
in the uh, market. So, this is uh, how money leads to capital. The circulation of money leads to capital. We see, therefore, that we have a monetary theory of value which leads to a monetary theory of capital. Uh, that is uh, capital as value in process. <coughs> okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> Let us move, move forward. <coughs> What appears as the simple circulation, which sometimes is uh, being regarded as something autonomous or something simple, which exists as a social um, uh, situation uh, per se, in reality is the facade of the whole capitalist process of production. The simple circulation is mainly an abstract sphere of the bourgeois overall production process, which manifests itself through its own determinations as a trend, a mere form of appearance of a deeper process, which lies behind it, the industrial capital. This is the first uh, form of the second chapter of the uh, critique of political economy, the so-called world text. So, um, it's very clear that Marx, from the first uh, uh, page of uh, Capital Volume 1, speaks about capitalism. And the famous phrase, the um, uh, wealth of uh, uh, capitalist societies appears as a, 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 a mass of commodities is very characteristic. I don't have the citation in front of me. I say it as I remember it. <laughs> the consequence of all the above is the following, that uh, despite certain ambiguities and uh, maybe contradictions that can be found in some of Marx's texts, all forms of labor that produce surplus value are productive. First of all, productive for the capitalist system, for capitalism, regardless of the branch or sphere of economic activity. Marx puts it this way. Um, and, uh, let me say this with this thing before, that um, we cannot separate the industrialist from the trader with um, a Chinese wall, because every capitalist is at the same time a merchant or a trader who buys commodities, labor, power, and uh, means of production, tries to buy these commodities as cheap as possible in order, in order to sell some other commodities, the output of the production process, um, uh, as dear as uh, is possible. So, uh, Marx writes that all forms of production, all productions, production processes that produce surplus value shall be regarded as productive in the framework of the capitalist system. And he writes, if we may take an example from outside the sphere of material production, a schoolmaster is a productive worker when in addition to belaboring the heads of his pupils, he works himself into the ground to enrich the owner of the school. That the, later, uh, that the latter has laid out his capital in a teaching factory instead of a sausage factory makes no difference to the relation. So the relation is the production has, has its uh, main characteristic, the production of uh, surplus value, the capitalist organization of labor, the production for uh, exchange and for profit. And here we have a private school which um, 
um, functions as any other capitalist uh, enterprise, although it does not uh, produce material goods. <coughs> And also this is um, very true if we take into consideration that uh, the subject that produces value and surplus value is not the isolated worker, but the um, collective worker, as Marx um, um, writes. First of all, the, the circulation as such, transport and so on. Marx writes, in so far as circulation itself creates costs, itself requires surplus labor. It appears as, as itself included within the production process. And second, the specialized worker produces no commodities. It is only the common product of all the specialized workers that becomes a commodity. The collective worker, that is the um, uh, community of all specialized workers, of all workers in a, an enterprise, are the ones that uh, produce the commodities and uh, therefore value and surplus value. Um, However, all the above, although they develop, they introduce and they develop Marx's analysis, they don't complete it. Because uh, in the third volume of Capital, Mar Marx uh, proceeds in a more concrete level of analysis and acknowledges that the place of Capital is in general occupied by two social characters a money capitalist and a functioning, functioning capitalist. That is, he introduces an, a new active subject, the money capitalist, which cedes his money to the functioning capitalism, capitalist. And this uh, scheme introduces the financial sphere and interest-bearing capital. Um, the following schema illustrates Marx's analysis. We have here what we have already seen, the um, capitalist buying labor power and means of production, combining them in the production process per se, uh, producing an output, selling, and so on. This is a higher, uh, a, a larger amount of money than the initial one. But this is only the functioning capitalist. Uh, capitalist. The function in capitalism uh, acquires the money from the money capitalist, which uh, becomes or is either a shareholder or a bondholder. Um, that is in the course of, of a lending process, the money capitalist, uh, A here, becomes the recipient and proprietor of a security S, that is to say, a written promise of payment from the functioning capitalist B. This promise certifies that A remains owner of the money capital M. He or she only cedes to B the right to make use of it, of the capital, for a specified period. So we have um, uh, the place of capital uh, occupied by agents that are bo both internal, the functioning capitalist, and external to the enterprise. The, the money capitalist is external to, uh, as regards the enterprise. Um, so we see a, a much more complicated picture than the simple picture of labor expended and so on. And <clears throat> uh, Marx writes that these two figures, the function capitalist and the money capitalist, work together and the one depends on the other. In the production process, writes Marx, the functioning capitalist represents capital against the wage laborers 
as the property of others and the money capitalist participates in the exploitation of labor as represented by the functioning, functioning capitalist. That is, the money capitalist is not some uh, simple speculator which uh, wants to exploit so the enterprise, but is represented by the uh, uh, functioning capitalist. And this um, relationship we must uh, see a little bit um, closer. Uh, first of all, we can say that uh, every capitalist uh, enterprise has therefore a genus existence as production means and as financial securities. Chrysler is a factory which assembles motor cars, okay, but at the same time, the, uh, the financial existence of Chrysler is its uh, securities, its shares and its uh, bonds. And of course, if someone wants to buy or to invest in uh, um, uh, Chrysler, uh, he or she will first of all, or this institution, buy shares of uh, Chrysler and so acquire shares in one way or the other. <coughs> so, uh, what is crucial here is that uh, these securities bonds and shares uh, have the character of sui generis, sui generis commodities, that is they are being traded in specific markets, capital markets, secondary markets. So the price of these securities does not emerge either from the value of the money made available or from the value of the real capital. Uh, you can put the word real in quotation marks. The ownership titles are priced on the basis of the estimated future income that they will yield for the institution or person owning them, which of course is part of the surplus value produced. In this sense, they are sui generis commodities plotting a course of their very own. And in this sense, writes Marx, capital as capital becomes a commodity. Capital appears as a mysterious and self-creating source of interest of its own increase. The thing, capital appears as a thing, as a security. The thing is now already capital simply as a thing. The social relation is consummated in the relationship of a thing money to itself. In this capacity of potential capital as a means of producing profit, it becomes a commodity, but a commodity sui generis, or what amounts to the same, capital as capital becomes a commodity. So we have here the financial mode of existence of capitalist property which is at the same time a, prop, a promise and a claim for appropriation of the surplus value that will be produced in the future. And, and thing, this creates a broader terrain uh, in which, within which its flow of income or, or money can be seen as a revenue corresponding to some form of capital which Marx names fictitious capital. Uh, in, th in this way, the pure and most developed form of appearance of capital is this fictitious form. And it is fictitious according to Marx, not in the sense of imaginary detachment from the real conditions of production, as, is, as is, is very often suggested, but fictitious in the sense that it reifies the capitalist production relationships, relations. We have here the whole um, fetishism issue, the fetishism of capital. Of, uh, so, 
Marx writes, the formation of fictitious capital is known as capitalization, a word that we all use now, and not only Marxist economists. The market value of these securities is partly speculative since it is determined not just by the actual revenue, but rather by the, by the anticipated revenue as reckoned in advance. So we have this peculiar situation. <clears throat> and we can say that uh, following the previous analysis of Marx, banks, insurance companies, funds, that is all um, enterprises of the financial sector are productive from the standpoint of capital. In the second volume of Capital, Marx writes, let us now consider the total movement, money, commodity, production, uh, output, commodity, more money. The capital that assumes these forms in the course of its total circuit is industrial capital. Industrial here in the sense that it encompasses every branch of production that is pursued on a capitalist basis. And banks, insurance companies, funds, and so on are uh, um, enterprises are branches of production pursued uh, on uh, a capitalist basis. Uh, and what we have all already referred to, all these securities actually represent nothing but accumulated claims. In all countries of capitalist production, there is a tremendous amount of so-called so interest-bearing capital or moneyed capital in this form. So, uh, uh, the, the, the financial existence of capital was always there from the very beginning of, of, of capitalism. And Marx's analysis sounds and is uh, today very modern, very up to date, because it focuses not on a special uh, historical era of capitalism, for example, England in the 19th century when Marx lived, but on the core of every capitalism, the capitalist mode of production, the ideal average, as Marx calls it. That is the structural, structural features of the capitalist system in general, or the causal relationships that operate beneath the surface of each and every capitalist society. You remember the citation of the uh, simple circulation being the facade of something uh, very deeper and uh, uh, more uh, uh, actual and more important, which is uh, industrial capital in the sense that uh, uh, Marx's definition um, conceives uh, the term industrial capital. So what has happened since the 80s and what is the reality nowadays? that is neoliberalism. Uh, is not, it has of course new aspects. Every uh, era of capitalism has its own aspects, but um, depends is a, a, an expression of the formal uh, characteristics of capitalism per se. Uh, the new era is characterized by an increase in non-bank funding of credit, the rapid uh, development of risk management techniques, uh, and of the financial sphere as a whole. And this development is um, very often described by the term financialization. We have an explosion of derivatives and other modern financial devices uh, as a uh, precondition for the 
this financialization. Uh, the function of these um, products uh, or sui generis commodities is to make concrete financial risk commensurate with one another and reduce their heterogeneity to a singularity. And this corresponds or emanates from what Marx na names the formal determinations of capitalism. Um, we can say therefore that financialization is not a deviation from a, or a distortion from some good industrial capitalism a bad exploitation form as opposed to some good exploitation by the productive industrial capital and so on, but a historic development expressing the formal determinations innate in the capitalist mode of production. And Marx uh, writes, uh, when we actually examine the social relations of individuals within their economic process, we simply have to adhere to the formal uh, determinations of this process itself. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the whole analysis that I am presenting opposes this, uh, all those approaches that conceive capitalist rule and exploitation as being constituted by a virtuous core that is productive accumulation, which should sub supposedly ensure income, uh, income increases for all participants, but which is being corrupted by non-productive financial speculation, casino capitalism, and so on. The rise of finance is neither a threat to industrial capital, nor does it indicate a weakness of the latter or its inability to secure proper accumulation patterns. Uh, financialization is much more a, a technology of power. Let me see. <coughs> uh, it's a, a particular mode of funding, economic activities, but at the same time, it, a particular technology of power, which is completely in line with the nature of, of uh, capitalist exploitation. The key role of financial markets is to monitor the effectiveness of individual capitals, facilitating within enterprises effective exploitation strategies. And uh, let me talk a little bit uh, on this issue. Let's take the manager. The manager plays a very crucial intermediary, in intermediary function, uh, be becoming a point of articulation between the despotism of the factory, which himself must impose, and the market discipline to which he himself or she herself is subject. The organized financial markets exercise a critical function. They reward profitable and competitive companies and at the same time punish those that are judged to be inefficiently profitable. The decisive criterion is that the value of the company's securities, shares and, bond, and bonds, as they are assessed by the international financial markets, markets should be maximized. Thus, thus, the interest of equity holders and bond holders are basically aligned with respect to enterprise profitability. Let me give you one example. When a big company, is dependent on financial markets for its funding. Every suspicion of inadequate valorization increases the cost of funding, reduces the capability that funding will be available, and depresses share and bond prices. Confronted with, with such a climate, 
the forces of labor within the enterprise face the dilemma of deciding, deciding whether to accept the employer's unfavorable terms, implying loss of their own bargaining position, or whether to contribute through their uh, inflexible stance, in, quot in quotation marks, to the likelihood of the enterprise being required to move to other spheres of production or to other countries. The dilemma is not uh, only hypothetical. Uh, very often, the manager, this intermedia, in, intermediary between the enterprise per se and the financial uh, market, markets puts the issue, accept the loss of capital or live with insecurity and unemployment. We are all in the same boat. Let's do our best so that the markets will not uh, uh, push us aside. Besides organized financial markets favor movement of capital worldwide, intensifying, cap intensifying capitalist competition, and securing more favorable conditions for valorization of individual capitals, that is, of uh, exploitation of labor. However, this whole process um, it's always and was always ca characterized by uh, certain instabilities. Uh, the tendency to towards instability uh, is and was intrinsic to capitalism from its very beginning. Financial instruments instruments uh, engendering new kinds of rationality from the promotion of exploitation strategies based on the total circuit of capital, at the same time downplay risk. The conditions for increasing class domination of capital appear simultaneously as conditions undermining that domination. Contemporary capitalism is caught in this exhausting tension between the need to be efficient, efficient and the underestimation of risks. When the risks become real, massive withdrawal from participation and funding takes place uh, because secure profit seems jeopardized. And in this um, framework, let me um, talk about two examples. First of all, uh, the finance and the 2008 uh, financial meltdown. Um, the 2008 crisis was systemic in the sense that it has been engendered by the elements and the relations that are at the core of the neoliberal neoliberal model, model. In other words, it is a crisis. It, it was a crisis which erupted in the financial sphere, but the financial sphere um, constitutes one of the core elements of capitalism and more specifically the neoliberal form of it. The blocking of the sphere of finance and credit funding was inevitably interpreted as involvement of the expanded reproduction of capital. This led to a fall in profitability and the necessity for cutbacks in production, overaccumulation of capital, and the need for a new cycle of restructuring. In other words, the interconnectedness the interconnectedness of events is a reverse of what is often maintained. What is involved is not a continuing crisis of overaccumulation during uh, dating from the 70s, which has fed superfluous, superfluous capital into the sphere of finance and in this way leading to speculation, the bubble and the crisis. The preceding uh, crisis of overaccumulation of capital had already been blunted through the contribution of the neoliberal settlement, the, the redistribution of income, uh, of uh, wealth and power 
to the favor of capital. Uh, in other words, the fall in the general rate of profit after the 2008 capitalist ca uh, uh, crisis was not the cause, but one of the effects of the crisis. <coughs> so, the second example is the COVID-19 conjuncture. After the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the crucial uh, political question for all bourgeoisie governments uh, was the following. How many deaths can I bear as society, as government, as um, system? For how long? And uh, so as not to destabilize the social alliances that support the hegemony of the capital. Of capital. And second, the second issue of the same question, the measures that will be taken to protect public health, which will necessarily lead to loss of income and economic recession, to what extent do they stabilize the social alliances that support the system? For how long and in what way do they modify them? So, uh, measures were taken, as we all know, which to a certain extent stem from the menu of the emergency states. Because the main, the, the basic function of the capitalist state is to subordinate the aspirations and practices of the root classes to the general capital interest, which is represented in the form of the national interest. In other words, capitalism promotes anything that is considered socially useful in so far as it supports the expanded reproduction of capitalist power. Hence, the bourgeoisie policy dilemma, public health versus capital profitability. Um, of course, the measures do not follow the framework of the pre-COVID-19 orthodoxy. How, um, however, um, these um, uh, measures do not challenge, they created, of course, a new socioeconomic landscape, but they do not challenge the core of the neoliberal settlement and arrangement. The new arrangements that were put forward do not question the international character of the financial system, securitization, the deepening of the market, the squeeze of the uh, uh, working people. Provisional allowances, subsidies, unemployment benefits to a higher extent than before and so on, plus uh, high public expenditures in infrastructure, energy, energy climate uh, change, and so on. Uh, maybe they seem something new, but they do not challenge the overwhelming correlation of power in favor of capital. <coughs> uh, so, after these two examples, I can come to my main conclusions. Conclusion number one, Marx's theory deciphers the decisive role of finance as a regulatory mechanism immanent in the capitalist production and reproduction process. Marx's theoretical analysis in capital allows one to comprehend neoliberal, neoliberalism not, not as an anti productionist agenda of certain parasitic strata of capitalist societies, financial speculators and rentiers, but as the par excellence strategy for the stabil stabilization of capitalist rule. Conclusion number two, the Keynesian or heterodox discourse about the converging interests of those inside the enterprise the so-called industrial community of laborers and managers, as against the outsiders of the financial sphere, is a figment of imagination. 
Such an outlook narrows the strategic horizon of the workers' movement, defending a supposedly improved or just capitalism, that is to say, a better version of class domination over, over and exploitation of the working majority. And conclusion number three, capitalism was always and will never cease to be exploitative, domineering, speculative, but it will not de disintegrate or decay due to its exploitative, domineering, speculative character, certainly no, not to, due to the supposedly specifically predatory function of the financial sphere as opposed to the productive role of industry, in quotation marks. It will continue to exist until the laboring classes overthrow it. But of course, for this, we need a revolutionary political agenda. I uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, John. Oh, John, thank you. Can you uh, turn the PowerPoint off? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Just a minute. Uh, yes. Stop share, yes. Okay. So everyone should save a picture of that last slide, or the entire slideshow, but it is part of our tape. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you also. I can send you the PowerPoint if we wish to share it with other people. Really good, John. Thank you. If people would like to show themselves, we can learn who each other is a little bit, but I understand not wanting to show yourself. There is no way we can build a movement to help overthrow capital until we know each other a little better than we do already. So um, on that note, when you have a question, type in the word stack in chat or raise your hand with the icon. And uh, uh, now that you're, more of you are showing yourself, I, I want to make sure that was a really incredible presentation, John. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, questions, comments? Uh, um, oh, Richard Myers. Yes, you are on stack. Go ahead, Richard. Yes, thank you very much, John, for that uh, uh, very um, clear uh, presentation of understanding of what's often a very hard to understand issue. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more and fill in a little bit more of what you said. Um, you know, if we're if we understand that Marx's um, ideas on monetary value theory uh, create a break with uh, Ricardo's the classical notion and so on, not just looking at the quantity of uh, labor, but the social relations. Um, how, how would you explain um, to people who maybe don't have much of a background in economics or radical economic theories, um, how Marx's uh, idea helps us to understand, as you pointed out, some of the issues here uh, of financialization under neoliberalism. Uh, could you just go a little bit more into depth or lay out a little bit more of your understanding, fill in for us, um, you know, how that, how that might appear, how that might help people to understand what's actually going on around us now as opposed to, you know, what we often get presented in sort of the mainstream uh, view of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, shall I respond to this question or, um, or let some more? I, I, I don't know, Michael. Well, we have. Can uh, you have that one noted? We could take Adam and Danny, and you could take three at a time. Okay. Adam Clark and Danny Rosa, you are both next. Go ahead, Adam. Okay, well, I, I really appreciate the presentation. I was kind of coming in and out um, just because I'm multitasking right now. But here's the question. It's, 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 it's in a different direction. Um, 
it's, this is an interesting presentation in light of stocks are at an all-time high right now, right? Um, and particularly tech stocks. And what, what, I what would be helpful for me in terms of understanding, if you could um, explain how maybe a high tech company that's very financialized like Apple or Microsoft, how that, how that exploits labor, you know, in terms of the financialization piece. And secondly, I'm wondering what, what's your understanding of crypto and defi decentralized finance, right? And in, in the coming megaverse and all, all that type of thing. Like how is, could you get, offer a Marxist analysis of how that's, um, d would you consider that exploitative? Some people see it as a, as a political move to get off of like currencies of, of nation states and it may be liberatory, but I'm wondering what your perspective on that is. Mm -hmm. okay. Danny, Danny Rosa, your turn. Uh, thanks, thanks, John. Um, I have a, I have a, maybe a, uh, I have a couple questions, but I'll, I'll just ask one for now. Um, and it's maybe a little more fundamental than the others. But um, I was curious if you might define exchange and um, talk about talk a talk a little bit about like what constitutes production for exchange and what exchange actually is um, and what, like would there be exchange uh, theoretically in uh, say communism? Mm -hmm. Well, John, you have uh, three uh, broad questions really. So there you go. Okay. So, uh, first to, to Richard's question, it's characteristic that Marx uh, describes all his works since uh, 1859, the critique of political economy, as critique of political economy, the subtitle of, um, of Capital is critique of political economy. Uh, also, also, the Grundrisse is Grundrisse of the critique of political economy and so on. So, which is this political economy uh, which Marx criticizes? It is Adam Smith and Ricardo. Only from the title we can see, we can uh, uh, speculate, think that uh, something um, different is here, okay? And, um, of course... Um, uh, the issue of financial markets is to impose discipline on the work, uh, discipline and mobility on the workings of uh, individual capitalists, capitals, that is, um, uh, capitalist enterprises. Uh, this condition, this, these two preconditions create unfavorable uh, situations for the working class in the enterprise because the enterprise has to depend on uh, financing from the um, uh, from the uh, from the markets and of course the markets imposed uh, this specific criteria to the um, um, enterprises and so on uh, uh, impose criteria which um, uh, intensify explo exploitation. Even if um, uh, the speculation that one enterprise is not doing well, uh, even if this speculation is not true, the end result will be the same because the effect on the shares and bonds of the enterprise uh, will force to the, um, the managers to impose restrictions, to uh, reorganize the whole production process, to um, uh, cut labor costs and so on. It's not uh, a chance that all this discussion and one major criterion of um, uh, the well-being of an enterprise is, is its ability to downsize labor cost. But what is labor cost? Labor cost, if we see it on a microeconomic level, 
is the living standard of the social majority of the working people. This is the labor cost which the enterprise wants to cut down in order to be effective and in order to be um, uh, to uh, um, uh, to have the benefits of uh, cheap uh, funding from the financial markets. Um, <clears throat> what happens during the era of um, uh, neoliberalism is the deregulation, or the deregulation of the financial markets, the new schemes of funding, special uh, utility vehicles, uh, the, anyone can uh, finance or lend money to anybody, and uh, the um, explosion of the sphere of fictitious capital, which encompasses not only the enterprises, but practically every entity which has also an economic function. For exa example, public schools, or universities, or hospitals, um, um, the, the, the state budget as well. It is a very characteristic case to see how the financial markets work, and in this working uh, the central banks play also a very important role. If you, we consider the um, uh, uh, European Union, uh, or rather the Euro area, and the role that the European Central Bank played during the crisis of 2008-2010, um, uh, uh, the Greek sovereign debt started suddenly uh, to, 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 uh, to, to be um, uh, not um, um, uh, manageable. That is, uh, the interest rates uh, uh, skyrocketed and uh, the Greek government could not uh, finance the, its creditors unless some outside um, uh, assistance was there. Why did it happen? It happened because the European Central Bank uh, refused at that time to finance uh, sovereign debts of the member states and more specifically of the states of the European South uh, as a principle of sane economic uh, practice. In, in, the only solution was to create another scheme which would finance these countries and the other scheme uh, was a combination of the IMF, the European Central Bank and uh, uh, the European governments, but uh, financial of the, of the sovereign debt was um, uh, bound to several preconditions which was a, a very severe austerity program. At that time, the Greek sovereign debt was much lower and continues to be lower than the sovereign debt, for example, of Japan. Although the, the Japan's sovereign debt was higher, Japan didn't have a solvency problem. Uh, Greece's sovereign debt is now higher than it was in 2008. But now interest rates are negative for Greece also. And, uh, and, 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 and the Greek state doesn't have a solvency problem. Why? Because now the policy has changed and the European Central Bank uh, covers uh, the, the, the Greek bonds. So the, the creditors of the Greek state know that they are going to take their, their money back due to the guarantee by the European Central Bank and the interest rates are very low and the Greek state can uh, borrow from the markets without any problem. Although as a, as a, a, a ratio to the GDP, 
the sovereign debt is now higher. This is a matter of politics. So the financial markets, central banks and so on, impose politics which have uh, certain, create certain results and have certain objectives. One objective at that time is to um, um, uh, put forward a very abrupt redistribution of income and power to the favor of capital and which could be implemented through extreme austerity policies, cuts of uh, uh, public spending as regards not the police, not the army, but hospitals, uh, public education, uh, uh, social wealth care and so on. So, uh, let's come and, 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 and the whole, the, this whole environment which has changed temporarily, for example, in Europe due to the COVID conjuncture, shows how um, um, things are determined by politics. And if there is for the system uh, a systemic risk, that is a risk uh, due to the movement of the laboring classes, a, a threat to the stability of the system due to the crisis, due to the mobilizations of the trade unions, of uh, left political parties, of the people on the road, then we have uh, changes of policies or when there is uh, instability and unknown parameters as in the case of COVID-19. Uh, this is the way I uh, explain or I interpret the Roosevelt um, era in the United States. Um, I focus on that speech in New York where he said that a government of the mob is uh, exactly as bad as a government of money. And so the, we need something uh, in, uh, uh, between these two extremes a government of the mob of a, or a government of money, and he took the measures of the so-called New Deal. So the, what an exchange um, 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 uh, concerns, I would say the following. Everything that is produced in capitalism is produced as a binary set. That is, as a thing, for example, this pencil, which bears a money name that it is not yet true because before it is being uh, sold. Of course, the capital, of course, the capitalist who produces this thing uh, knows that there are other pencils in the market that uh, the pencils imported from China are very cheap, of course, but they are not so good. So uh, he had or he has or she has to select a, a price that uh, will stress the quality, but also is not so expensive and so on. And he puts a, a, an imaginary um, ticket on this uh, pencil saying uh, one euro or one dollar. And then he goes to the market or she goes to the market and can get due to changes in uh, the conditions of the market actually one dollar in most cases or point uh, nine or one point uh, one or nothing if um, the price is nothing because people think that um, it's much better to not to buy pencils or to buy other pencils, uh, then the labor expend, exp expended for the production of uh, these um, uh, pencils is socially zero. So uh, exchange, uh, production for, for exchange uh, means that uh, everything carries a money name from the onset, from the beginning, before even before it's been produced, it is scheduled, it is uh, pro pro programmed to uh, uh, create 
uh, money. It, it's pro produced because it is money, it can bring money, it can yield money. And of course, not any quantity of money, but that quantity of money that uh, asserts for the enterprise at least the uh, uh, average profit. If an enterprise cannot achieve an uh, adequate pro profit for the midterm for a, a longer period of time, then this enterprise uh, will change the production process. It, it, the, the enterprise will liquidate it. The financial sphere is there to take care of it. So the money available uh, will move to another branch of production where the profit rate is higher and many other capitalists will intrude in, in this um, uh, branch with higher profit rate and uh, how can an outsider intrude a new uh, branch by lowering the price and by lowering the price it, uh, the profit rate is a little bit lowered and so this um, uh, competition between individual capitals and branches of production um, form the, the tendency towards a, a, an average profit rate uh, although in, in the capitalist economy as a whole, as Marx describes in the third volume of Capital. I, I, I'm not sure I have uh, tackled every issue raised, but if not, I can uh, come again to the issue. Okay. Uh, you, you, you have to. Um, I'm seeing if anyone has their hand up or, oh, Victor, you are next. Go ahead, Victor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I, oh. Victor Ochoa. I'm sorry, Victor Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> Victor Ochoa, you are on stack. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to step away for a bit. I've been kind of going in and out, so I apologize if I'm I'm being um, redundant. But one of the things I would be very interested in is uh, a more analysis on the on the intercapitalist class contradictions um, and whether or not we're seeing. Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's a struggle within the capitalist class itself. And uh, so, uh, but I don't think that we don't, at least I don't see, maybe I don't see enough, uh, read enough, but I don't see that much analysis of that, that the inter intercapitalist contradictions um, and how that affects the, the general course of development in our country. Um, and, you know, it, we have the fossil fuel industries, industrial capital, I assume, uh, and is that in contradiction now, and is it being left behind? So, sort of like the the uh, the in uh, intra what, is that the right? Is it intra class? Yeah, I think it's intra class struggle within capitalist class itself, uh, and how you view that. It is important. Is it important for us to look at that? Um, uh, not that important. Um, I'm just curious about that because I just see to me I'm seeing a lot of contending forces. And trying to make sense out, out of it is pretty difficult sometimes. So I'd be really interested in your comments about um, intra-class conflict within the, the capitalist ruling class. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, John, I, uh, I'm trying to wait for there to be three, but Victor is the only one at the moment. But I'm sure okay. there will be more questions. Oh, Janice. Go ahead, Janice. Oh, thank Sorry. you. Hi, uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, and I hope I can get the slides. Um, I don't know if this is off topic. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can offer um, a succinct, maybe Marxist critique of uh, modern monetary theory, which is being heavily promoted in left liberal circles by the likes of Stephanie Kelton. Um, 
I guess that's it for my question. Uh, this idea of, you know, printing a lot of money, well, an infinite amount of money and just carrying over the debt. I mean, in in my understanding, I'm no expert on this, but it seems to me that the, it just, uh, I don't know, continues the Keynesian model, if I'm understanding correctly. I'm wondering if you can speak more to MMT. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, now you have Victor and Jenna, so uh, we'll... This is uh, round two, and we'll have okay. a round okay. oh, And me. Sorry. Oh, Gunet, you didn't write stack. Gunet, you can yeah, come in now. I'm sorry. I didn't write stack. I'm sorry for that. <clears throat> it's okay. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's a great presentation, uh, but I want to be provocative. It, it, it sounds linear to me that... What Marx has explained in 1883 stands valid. There's nothing to add to it. And I, I don't agree with that. I think particularly on the side of finance, there's a lot that has changed since Marx's time. For instance, <clears throat> Until 1960, 1860, uh, uh, finance, as in uh, shares and bonds, was limited to infrastructure companies in England, you know, rail and so on, and some trading. Uh, it was not, you know, uh, as yet uh, made accessible to manufacturing companies. So it's only after 1960 that manufacturing companies started to access long-term finance as in bond and equities. <clears throat> so at that time, Marx is already writing capital, you know, way advanced. And um, my sense, which John Toporowski and others uh, also share, is that Marx did not adequately elaborate uh, finance in his theory. Uh, he does note it, but he does not adequately elaborate it. So I think we see it more in from his followers in the eight, in the 19th century, in the 20th century. I'm sorry, um, uh, Hilda, 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 Hilda Fee, you know, would be the first one, the one on the finance capital, you know. Uh, Kaleki to me presented a far, Kaleki presented a far more better a theory of value that integrates finance. It was similar to Keynes, but unlike Keynes, he knew, Kaleski knew that uh, capitalists don't have a permanent means of managing business cycle like Keynes thought, you know, through the aggregate demand. Uh, uh, Kaleski knew that um, they will always oppose it, you know, and um, and so and so finance now, and you do note it that it has become so proliferated that um, it leads to serious crisis all the time. Uh, in fact. I think the crisis of accumulation in the 80s, early 90s, uh, was not resolved. Instead, finance uh, was liberalized. And so that's why we saw, I mean, financialization. Uh, and, and it creates this uh, financial crisis all the time. 
uh, that don't get resolved. So I, I would still think it, it still requires a lot of further research and theorization by Marxists, you know. Uh, but I also agree with you that the resolution of the problem is not in just bringing new insights about the new phenomenon, but rather in the class struggle, which is what the Keynesians don't get. The Keynesians don't get. Uh, so so I, I, would, I would challenge you, I would like to hear your reaction to say, what are the new insights uh, should we throw? For instance, I mean, uh, Paul Suez in the US and, and, and Mark Dove, you know, uh, theorize some of these questions. Uh, so I, I would like to hear uh, that uh, we need uh, new insights uh, because capital today suffers from, I mean, Karl Marx, I think in volume two, and Rosa Luxemburg comes in to say, uh, to dis in discussing the, the, the second uh, scheme of reproduction, I don't think he completed it, you know, and uh, which is why the realization problem that Rosa Luxemburg picks up and others take it further, Kalecki in particular. So I would like to hear your, your reaction to this provocation of mine. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for taking long. So there you go, John. You have three. And then there are more people already for the next round. So go okay. ahead. Uh, first of all, the issue of <clears throat> internal in, uh, class contradictions or class uh, or contradictions between uh, fractions of capital. Um, my understanding is as follows. Uh, first of all, that um, all capitalist enterprises are involved in a similar um, um, circle of money, commodity money, more money in any branch. That is, um, um, uh, money buying commodities, uh, producing another commodity, and um, realizing more money than the initial amount uh, invested. Uh, this this uh, whole cycle presupposes competition between uh, individual capital, capitals, which of course is a very contradictory ter terrain. There are contradictions between these enterprises and we see enterprises going up or going down, branches, um, um, uh, decaying or declining and others um, uh, through also uh, technological innovations um, taking the lead and so on. However, I think that if we um, uh, want to understand the problem in its totality, we have to take um, into consideration also the political element. That is the way capitalist fractions are formed as different uh, strategies of um, um, imposing to the laboring people, to the social majority, to those, to the majority which is being exploited, capitalistically exploited, to impose to them the uh, overall or the strategic capitalist interest. I think that this issue is played to a large extent on the political scene, scene. that is on party politics as well. Uh, we can um, 
differentiate social democracy, for example, if we take a very traditional example, the European social democracy of the uh, 1960s or 1970s from the conservative parties of the same period as different uh, forms of integrating um, uh, popular interests or practices. And when I say popular, I mean uh, labor, but also of the middle classes, of the small uh, uh, entrepreneurs or the, 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 the self-employed into a capitalist strategy. And that is why we have um, um, different political strategies and conflicts. That is political conflicts in which large masses of people uh, participate or um, support the one fraction of the, or the other. Um, in other words, I think that the whole uh, party system or the uh, parliamentary system is a terrain where the social uh, differences are transformed it, into differences between, in the last instance, uh, capitalist strategies. And that the uh, uh, intervention of the popular masses um, favor in the one conjuncture, the one in the, in the other, the other uh, political fraction of the bourgeoisie. Of course, there is a, a lot more of analysis and discussion to take place in this direction. But I pose myself a question. Can we interpret the Trump phenomenon or the conflict between Trump and the Democratic Party or the, the fractions within the Democratic Party uh, in this framework as uh, um, results in the last instance of uh, asp aspirations of movements of the popular masses. Can we interpret the, um, uh, the loss of Trump and the victory of Biden, the electoral victory of Biden, uh, not taking into consideration the Black Lives Matter movement. I think no, and the Black Lives Matter movement is of course an issue of uh, uh, perpetuating uh, racism but it, in the United States, but it is not only this, it has to do with uh, other uh, contradictions of movements which uh, uh, um, characterize the society as a whole. And we have to also um, reflect on the people who follow Trump and follow, follow his course in this way that they follow it. So I think that the issue of fractions and contradictions inside the bourgeoisie has to take into consideration also the political and the ideological elements of capitalist role. Uh, of course, the, the, the deep base of all this, the fundament the, 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 is the economic contradictions, but uh, we cannot um, or we shall not um, abstract from the political and the uh, ideological element. So, um, to the question of the supply of money and so on, <clears throat> and other theories having to do with um, uh, so-called uh, uh, quantity theory of money, uh, printing money of, or not. I think that uh, we have to question the direction of the um, um, uh, of the flow of um, uh, cause and effect. 
that is uh, is the uh, uh, the economy the contradictions of the capitalist economy the tendencies of the capitalist economy which explain the quantity of money that is being uh, um, introduced into the economy or it is otherwise as the mainstream theories claim that is there is an ex external factor the central bank which creates a, a, a bigger or a smaller quantity of money and uh, supplies the economy with it. I think that the first um, approach is more correct. If we take into consideration that the, we don't have on the one hand a quantity of money and on the other hand a, a quantity of things or uh, merchandises or commodities and then there is a, 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 a a somewhat correlation between the one amount and the other. If we take into consideration that the commodity is a binary set, that is from the beginning it bears an imaginary or real money name, it's a, a form that it is going to be transformed into, into money and so it is produced because it is in quotation marks, money, uh, we reach the conclusion that uh, there is not such a question as uh, which co um, uh, quantity of money, uh, but there is a question of different monetary policies from the side of the authorities and also a correlated question of the conjuncture of uh, the economy, that is if we have a boom or a crisis or a stabilization period which um, um, uh, ends up in creating this or the other quantity of money. A, 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 a policy of low interest rates of course on the one hand favors, uh, is supposed to favor investment because the um, uh, income that one can gain from putting the money in uh, a bank or in uh, uh, other products of the financial uh, sphere, for example, buying bonds or share and so on. When it is uh, small, it favors the um, canalization of money to direct investment, but the whole picture is much more complicated, uh, I think. Um, on this question and on, on the last one, I have to say that there are many Marxist approaches and uh, many historical or uh, more recent debates. Uh, there is this famous uh, discussion uh, which you um, mentioned uh, having to do with the critique of Rosa Luxemburg to the reproduction schemes of the second volume of Capital. Uh, my personal view, and I have uh, um, written on this, I have published some uh, articles in Rethinking Marxism and elsewhere, is that Rosa Luxemburg was not right. That Marx was correct on the level of abstraction of these schemes. Also, my approach to the um, um, monopoly capitalism view of Magdoff, Sweezy, and so on um, is different. I don't think that we have uh, um, such a an, an development as these authors um, write. Uh, of course, and I, 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 I said about this, that um, <clears throat> every period of capitalism has its own different characteristics. And of course, nowadays financialization is a, a development which um, has a unique 
features. However, it can be compared to a certain extent to the period before the First World War, when again we had uh, regulated markets and uh, increase uh, of schemes of um, um, uh, lending and funding, which had similarities with what happens today. Of course, we didn't have the same technology. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have, through these new technologies, the connections or the connection on a 24 our basis of the stock markets of Tokyo, New York, London, and so on. There are, there are many differences, but we also had schemes of uh, uh, non, non bank uh, funding and lending. We also had uh, um, unification of markets, uh, downsizing of regulations, and so on. And all this changed, of course, radically after the Second World War, when we had this period of the Bretton Woods um, <clears throat> Agreement and uh, the uh, separation of banks to, uh, between uh, deposit banks and investment banks and so on, which created the uh, uh, national and much more regulated financial spheres. Uh, all these were uh, overturned by the uh, neoliberal uh, revolution or con counter, counter revolution, I, I, uh, either of which you prefer. But I think that the present discussion about the financial sphere outside mainstream economics that is in um, uh, the so-called heterodox economics, which are very much uh, influenced by the thought of Keynes, Kalecki, and others, Veblen as well, puts forward a dichotomy between the rentier, which is counterproductive, whose euthanasia uh, Keynes expected within two generations. And uh, the insiders of the enterprise, which is the so-called industrial community, and a contradiction between these two, which has many supporters and proponents also among Marxists, this scheme, which, according to my view, is not Marx's idea. I cited Marx saying how the money capitalist, that is the outsider, uh, is represented by the uh, uh, function capitalist, that is the manager, the industrial, the head of the so-called industrial community, and that actually the gap the of the, the, the class the, the, the main class class conflict uh, in the capitalist economy is between on the one side ma the money capitalist and the uh, functioning capitalist and on the other the wage earner the labor the laboring class the working class uh, of course, one can ask the question, is there not uh, a contradiction between the money capitalist, uh, capitalist and the uh, manager? Of course, there is one. And um, uh, uh, if the interest rates of lending are high, this is not in favor of the manager. It creates problems to the manager who wants to um, uh, manage to, to, to control this uh, relationship with the money capitalists in a way that the uh, interest rates are low. But how can this happen? I uh, uh, refer to a very typical example where this can happen if the manager uh, tames the working class and suppresses 
the trade unions and cuts the uh, so-called um, uh, labor costs and reorganizes the, the, the factory in a, a way that uh, it depends much more on robots than on labor and uh, achieves that the workers themselves vote not to have a trade union in the factory. If all this happens, the shares of the factory will rise and the interest rates of the lending will uh, uh, be lowered. So we see that through this conflict, the main uh, contradiction, which is between the capitalist class with the two agents, the money capitalist and the functioning capitalist on, in, on the one side and the working class on the uh, other side is fueled as well uh, through the contradiction of the two um, characters of the uh, belonging to the ruling capitalist class, the money capitalist and the functioning capitalist. This is my view and I think that there is a problem with many um, approaches, Marxist approaches, and very um, um, famous ones, um, as uh, those of uh, Robert Brenner, for example, or others, who in a way or another incorporate the Keynesian scheme of the dysfunctional and um, um, a parasitic character of the financial sphere, which I don't um, uh, uh, believe that uh, is Marxist uh, core idea. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, Chris Knight has a question, and I will see if there are others. If not, I will have one. Go ahead, Chris Knight. It's actually Steve Knight. The, the Chris Knight is here, too. But. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, and, and thank you, John. I think you really made an, an, an excellent presentation today. I really appreciate it. Um, I kind of have a question that's kind of related to the environment, which is sort of timely, you know, what with the COP26 meeting going on right now in Glasgow and people are talking about it. But basically my question is, that, and it kind of has to do with the theory that I have about financialization or fictitious capital as, as you've described it, is that um, it seems to me that all concerns about the environment or ecology are inherently connected to our material relationships, our material physical relationships with the world around us. Whereas the financialization that's happened in the neoliberal era has increasingly tended to, it seems to me, to remove us from direct contact with much of the physicality around it. I, I mean, I'm thinking in a, a very current example would be that the New York Stock Exchange is now has now begun offering what they call natural asset companies. They're actually, you know, you can buy a waterfall, you know, buy shares in a waterfall or buy shares in a, in a farm or something like that. And, and it just, it seems to me that the financialization or the, the conversion into fictitious capital, if I, if I take them to be roughly equivalent, the financialization of nature is, has made it all the more difficult for us to deal with the problems of the, you know, environmental degradation and climate change and all this stuff I'm sure people are aware of. So I just, I would just be interested to hear your thoughts about whether you think, um, the, whether you think fictitious capital and the increasing prevalence of it uh, in our economy has made, has made it harder for us to deal with the physical world around us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there anyone else with a question? John, that is kind of a standalone question, uh, as Steve put it. So why don't you address that, and then we will uh, have another round, a okay. short round. So go ahead. I, mean, I think that I agree with Steve uh, that um, all this issue with um, 
um, the waste, uh, the, the, the waste, uh, pricing wastes, and uh, the financialization of physical of the physical world uh, makes it much difficult, much more difficult to tackle the problem as such, which is a problem of the physical world, of course. Uh, I would say that um, um, is one of the techniques in the end effect that the financial sphere develops in order to overcome <coughs> state regulations or to, tra to transform state regulations into economic, that is mo mo monetary, uh, magnitudes which uh, can be transferred from one entity to another, from one country to another, from one enterprise and so on to another. Um, however, um, there is of course um, um, an issue in uh, the physical world as well. I mean that uh, there are um, uh, sectors of capitalism, development, uh, the so-called green capital, which um, try to um, uh, exploit the um, uh, new uh, conditions that are created by the environmental crisis and the um, a shift from the black economy, from carbon, from uh, uh, oil and so on, to renewable uh, forms of energy and so on. And there is also a question, who pays this uh, transfer, to what expand, ex extent the costs of this transformation uh, are going to be placed on the shoulders of the working class once more and what is the role of the enterprises. But uh, what the question uh, concerns, I certainly agree that uh, f f uh, when you create uh, financial products which um, um, put a price on such uh, environmental issues in such um, um, uh, conditions as um, uh, creating wastes and so on, complicates the issue and uh, makes uh, even more difficult the um, uh, goal to have a sustainable uh, uh, way of life on this planet. Okay. <clears throat> so, John, I don't know how to ask this question, but since so much of what investment is is speculative investment, it seems inherent to speculation that there is an anticipation of by the investors, or at least groups of them, for fictional capital in that especially in this era where the digital controls of investment groups are, are so powerful with all the computerization we as a class have made, the, the, the amount of memory and al the algorithmic uh, uh, calculations made by investment groups, you see this on a, daily basis. I watch fellow workers who have been won over to being day traders. <laughs> I mean, productivity of labor goes down in some places by the number of workers who are hiding their, their day trading over at their, the computer at their, their job. But we see that the, their, the, this, I forget who posed the question on the stock market has never been so high as it is now. But so much of that height in the stock market is on this speculation and the, the large holders selling off when their algorithms tell them that or tell, inform the, those pulling the trigger on investment to 
extract your profit for now, even though that profit that they are taking may very well be fictive, not based on real production that is taking place. Yet uh, we have this continuing at ever greater rates. Is there going to be some type of correction as in the capitalist terms, uh, like 1929 was in a, in a way? When, when you mention that we are in a condition such as leading up to the First World War, and that world wars as a way of capital to get rid of the old basis and make a new real basis doesn't seem to be a physical possibility without destroying the basis of life. So the things such as the pandemic and other crises, such as what the people of the workers of Greece were put through and other countries that uh, try to change things. And much of this goes back to the beginning of neoliberalism and the taking away of the social wage in New York City. Um, my real, I'm not getting to a real pinpointed question, but is there, to me, uh, your, your talk uh, very much says that the capitalist is doing fictive and real investment and is either conscious or not conscious of this. How can we bring this type of awareness to our working class movement? And, and this moment uh, seems the moments we're living through make, are very apparently capital will be nationalistic where the individuals are in a nation, but capital more and more is functioning as an international class, forcing we as workers to identify with only our nation rather than our our our, our universal class position. So that's just me saying some things without pinpointing a question, but if you could okay. uh, address that to a degree. Yes, Michael, I think that you are correct. Uh, we surely are going to see another correction and uh, the 2008 crisis was, was such a correction. And um, mainstream economists always thought that, um, of course, markets regulate automatically or uh, contradictions and so on. But uh, more specifically, they think that these complicated algorithms and the mathematical progr programs and uh, the um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, technical intelligence, uh, how it's called, that it's uh, been created, is going to solve uh, any problem. But all these models uh, actually base themselves on past data and past patterns. Of course, they, they make correlations of different uh, effects and situations and so on, but in the end effect, they base themselves on what has happened in the past. And so um, the best artificial intelligence or um, uh, the technical schemes and algorithms and so on uh, cannot uh, anticipate the future but through the uh, glasses of increasing capitalist profitability. And to, to tell you an example which was characteristic in the two, 2008 crisis, um, if you have a very respective and old and well-organized bank, bank like the Citigroup or the Deutsche Bank and so on, and uh, next to them, you have schemes which um, uh, create profits of 10 or 12 or 15 percent. And the banks um, uh, only create profits of, uh, for example, for their um, uh, bonds, uh, uh, for the people who, who buy bonds from them and so on, of 2 or 3 percent. Then uh, th th there is... Um, uh, through this competition, 
there is a, a, an incentive for the banks to create special utility vehicles to um, um, follow the outsiders, to uh, underestimate the risk, to protect uh, against uh, known risks, and uh, uh, then the crisis and the correction, as you, you say, suddenly appears when nobody um, uh, expects it. And there is um, a very good um, citation by Marx in the second volume of Capital, um, based on another argument, that is, um, Marx wanted to say that um, the ones who claim that uh, the crisis comes due to the underconsumption of the, of the masses, uh, have to explain to us why every crisis erupts when things go very well, when uh, wages are at the highest level of the historical period, and when also uh, profits are very high. So, when wages rise and everything sing, seems to be uh, to, going well and the shares rise and, uh, and so on, maybe this is the harbinger of the storm coming. And <laughs> this, uh, although he criticizes what nowadays can be called a Keynesian approach, of course, uh, Keynes did not exist at that time, but the approach was there, that the whole issue was an, an issue of uh, a, a lack in, uh, in, uh, in demand, and so the wages had to rise and so on. Um, criticizing this issue also uh, takes a stance on the fact that uh, every crisis is not predicted despite the fact that models seem to become uh, sophisticated and more sophisticated and by the use of uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the um, uh, enormous um, of an enormous amount of data and uh, big computers and so on everything is under control in the reality uh, it is not true that everything is under control and what is true is that we are going to face other crises like the one of 2008 and more uh, of the interwar periods. And capitalism is, uh, by its nature, speculative and uh, leads from the one crisis to the other. And of course, even in, 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 in phases uh, that uh, we have not a crisis, but a boom and so on. It's a domineering and exploitative system which, is, uh, which has to be uh, replaced by another system, more humane and so on. That is a very true statement, John. We do <laughs> have to replace the system. Um, um, I, I, we are at the, the stated closing time, but this is so, if there is anyone with a final question, if not, oh, oh, I thought Victor was raising his hand. He's applauding. John, thank you very much. We have thank to- Thank you have also, time. thank you. We need to develop this more, maybe in the late winter, early spring, you would visit again. And, and we can, uh, well, I, I know that there's been a large body of work and we would be more than happy to have you come back again. And thank you, thank you. Yes. Look forward to I it. Learned. Yes. And thank you to everyone who came. This is how we get some type of movement together that replaces that damn thing that we've made, but we have no control over unless we take the control. Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you thank soon. You. Thank, thank you, John. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>